Welcome to Sunday Mornings at Bethesda The Link. So glad you've come along. And today, our worship calls us to think about and focus what it means to be between a rock and a hard place. Turning to what's new this morning, please do make sure that you have a chance to read through your bulletin. If you uh, do not receive one, uh, send me an email and I'm, I'll make sure you're on the list. And uh, in this week's uh, bulletin of special note this morning is to note that today is the World Day of Overcoming Poverty. And there is a link uh, if you want to discover more and be supportive of this uh, important uh, marker in our collective life. Uh, there is a link there to the International Day for the Eradication of Poverty, and also, as it happens today, thanks to the work of Verna and Donna and Lyle, our Straight and Narrow Way has uh, reopened and has been reconfigured. Uh, the Straight and Narrow Way, which has as its central focus the Golden Rule. And if any of you here or watching are not sure what the Golden Rule is, two choices. Google it and you'll find out, or come along to the link and walk the straight and narrow way, and you'll quickly see the link between the golden rule and today's emphasis on the World Day for Overcoming Poverty. Uh, so continuing in worship now, let us continue to gather in our opening prayer. Let us pray. Your spirit, God, works in our weakness until we are aflame with your love and power. Fill the hearts of your faithful with living fire that we may set the world ablaze through Jesus Christ, to whom with you and the spirit be honor and praise now and forever. Amen. And our opening hymn this morning, like the murmur of the dove song, like the challenge of her flight, like the vigor of the wind's rush, like the new flame's eager might. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Continuing in worship, our opening prayer. Fill the hearts of your faithful with living fire, that we may set the world ablaze through Jesus Christ, to whom with you and the Spirit be honor and praise now and forever. Amen. And our for children who are watching this morning, and for everyone, a children's time focus in faith. Here. This morning. And so on the take home sheet, uh, we have this sharing. And again, this week, I feel compelled to read it so that we can all hear it and take it in. Jesus once served thy, the disciples by doing something only servants did in those days. He washed their feet. Well, you probably wouldn't see that too much today, I don't think. Does that happen at your house? No, it does? Oh, you wash your own feet or you wash other people's feet? Maybe both happens. That would, be, <laughs> that would be good. I know in my house, I get instructions to wash my feet before doing this or that. In any case, Jesus did what a servant would have done in those days. 
and he washed the disciples' feet, what usually a servant would do. And in so doing, Jesus tells all of us that lesson to serve others. And so the questions in our take-home sheet come to us for all of us to think about. How can we serve others? How, can we, how do you think your friends and family would react if you did those things to serve them? Good things to ponder on the day when we're thinking about the golden rule, about how to go forward as a church and how to go forward as daughters and sons of God. Amen. And our hymn of preparation this morning is O Breath of Life. O Breath of Life, come sweeping through us. Revive your church with life and power. O Breath of Life, come cleanse, renew us. And lift your church to meet this hour. Lord God, come sweeping through us. Come sweeping through us as the scriptures are read and reflected on, as images are shared, as perspectives are given. Holy Spirit, take any word that is spoken, any images and thoughts that are shared, and please, God, use them. Use them to the growing, the convincing, the comforting, and the challenging of your church, your people, in these days and all days. Amen. In the church of Pentecost, and yes, the church has its own seasons. Something, well, that's typical of the church. It does its own kind of unusual, maybe even weird thing to some, but there's a real reason for that. And that is that by faith, uh, God calls us to live as salt, as the take-home uh, gave us last week, to be salt and light, to live as an alternative to the ways of the world, which are so often uh, destructive and not life-giving. And so the church here frames that intention and that life-giving movement. And so the season of the church here that we are in now is Pentecost, which celebrates the birth of the church on Pentecost Sunday, thus the red and the flames as the Spirit came like tongues of fire, but also celebrates the ongoing growth of the church. And that is the reason why the color of the church year is green, as my stole indicates, and as the Celtic cross signifies our particular church history and DNA, residing partly in the Presbyterian Church. And so this fall, we are concentrating uh, uh, on the church in Pentecost, and we began by uh, noting uh, some important scriptures about the church. First from Colossians, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. And at this point, I would like to sound an important note to say this church, all churches uh, that seek to follow and to worship Christ, uh, do so uh, from a theological perspective, not just historic, not just pragmatic, not just because we've fallen into it after 2021 years of history of the church, but rather a theological reason 
the birth of that church in Acts. And Acts was a two-part book with the Gospel of Luke being the first part. That church was and is the church of the resurrection. And the resurrection itself was not, I repeat, was not written back into the gospel records, as was mentioned a few weeks ago, as a way of wounded uh, disciples trying to uh, buck themselves up and make, uh, make sense of a tragic situation. No, they didn't write the resurrection back into the gospel. In fact, the gospels were written some years after the resurrection. A hundred years in some case, they were written because of living through the resurrection, having experienced Christ among them, have experienced Christ moving among them to grow the church in unique ways. That resurrected Christ called forth the church to live as an alternative community, to say that each and every person had a part to play in the church. It was inclusive in that best of the modern sense of that word. We saw too that the church was birthed in the resurrection and in hope. This quote from Marianne Williamson, love is what we are born with, fear is what we learned here. The spiritual journey is the unlearning of fear and the acceptance of love back into our hearts. It is the movement of the resurrection in and through hope. And then we uh, stopped to think about one of the images of the church, that being the vine, a prominent image here at Bethesda with the, brand, with the vines growing out of the candelabra, the light of the world being, the, being Christ, us being the branches, the branches of that vine in which we are to abide. And so we come to this morning titled Between a Rock and a Hard Place. Well, honestly, I don't always know how it is that sermon titles come to me. Uh, sometimes they, they just do while journeying here or there or reading a bit in a newspaper or hearing a song on the radio or spending time in prayer or the scriptures. Uh, but this phrase came up a couple of times this, this, this past week. The original phrase uh, was, uh, came into being with uh, miners in uh, the uh, New Mexico of the United States in uh, the 1830s. And the, uh, the image, the point, is that these miners were literally working in rock in very harsh conditions and then their employers made that hard to get through rock a hard place by saying you either go with our requirements or you're going to be deported. So their choice was to stay with family and a place that they knew, to stay with a known way of earning a living, or that hard place of being forced to leave. Some of them stayed, many of them left. And so that phrase entered into our conversation and our dialogue. Well, how does that apply to the church? Well, as nudging a little bit farther along the road, I'll make passing reference to there being a Rolling Stones song, who are also in the news these days, perhaps as a bit of encouragement to any of us who are getting older. In fact, uh, one article said, how is it that Mick Jagger can seem still be in his prime at 79? Well, I don't think the Rolling Stones are, are any uh, great purveyors of morality and wisdom and an example, but they did write this song called A Rock and a Hard Place. Here are some of the lyrics. The fields of Eden are full of trash. Well, if we beg and we borrow and steal, we'll never get it back. People are hungry, they, they crowd around, and the city gets bigger as the country comes begging to town. 
And uh, uh, there is a, a YouTube uh, version of that song if you want to listen to it. So the song positions the question, how is the earth going to survive between the challenges that many people, all of us, are facing between being between a rock and a hard place? Well, turning our filter back to the church and going with this phrase, I'm sure many or most of us will recall that Jesus is referred to as the rock. Peter's confession, you are the Messiah. Elsewhere in scripture, Jesus is called the rock on which God is building the church. And so the invitation today is to think of Jesus and to experience Jesus as that rock, that solid place. It also says in scripture that Jesus is a stumbling rock to some. John O'Donohue, in Drilling Down in a Theology of Earth and Rock, notes the spirituality of rock as being ancient, as seemingly immovable, but having a hidden life. And so it is that Christ's love, immovable and eternal, and yet by the Spirit, creating and generating the church and life and love. Well, if the invitation is to think of Jesus as the rock, what's the hard place? Well, let me suggest this. The hard place is that place of the church and Bethesda Church in 2021. The hard place of living in and through Christ and yet seeing our church seemingly diminish or shrinking or not having influence or not being the place we would want it to be. You'll notice that in this image, in that rock and in that other hard place, there is growth, there is potential, there is possibility. There is growth, there is potential, there is possibility. And so there, there are many uh, examples readily found of how it is that this church, our church, all churches in a hard place, how we can think about that reality and how to move forward in it and through it. And I would like to suggest that the best way of thinking about how to be a church between the rock, who is Christ, and that hard place of seeming, uh, seeming nonchalant or seeming uh, irrelevance or disinterest is to look first in the scriptures. And so a series of scripture readings, images, and reflections. And to all of those of you gathered here this morning, and those of you watching on YouTube, if you're at all connected to Bethesda, please keep this invitation in, in mind. As we go through these scriptures and these uh, concerns about how to best be the church, I'm going to post them on an email in a summary fashion. From those concerns, I'm going to invite and to ask that people choose what they think are the top four concerns. Could be for them, or they might think about who, what the four concerns are for the church. And those four concerns will become the shape and the focus of our worship life into 2022 in Epiphany, in Lent, in Pentecost, and creation. This invitation keeps up the theme of knowing ahead of time a, a year's plan. So with that in mind, we turn to our first scripture reading and our, our first image and our first word turning to Proverbs, chapter 29. 
Where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the road ahead is unclear and uncertain. With our Bethesda vision, maybe you don't know what it is, maybe you don't know where to find it. It's in our website, it's in annual reports. Go have a look and see if you feel Bethesda has a vision and if it is giving life and if it, unlike this road, is, is a road that doesn't just lead off into an unknown horizon, but leads into a specific place, a specific way of being the church. Do we have a vision? What is our vision? Is it being lived out? Our second scripture, Matthew chapter 28 and verses 16 to 20. Hear the word of the Lord. Meanwhile, the 11 disciples set out to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had arranged to meet them. When they saw him, they fell down before him, though some hesitated. Jesus came up and spoke to them. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe all the commands I gave you. And look, I am with you, yes, to the ends of the earth. Well, this passage from Matthew's Gospel is known far and wide as the Great Commission. The commission to go and not just uh, give slogans, not just give altar calls, not just have bumper stickers or stock phrases, but go and make disciples. Share the good news so that people follow Christ in life-giving ways. And yes, baptizing them as a way of recognizing and signifying that discipleship and obeying the commands. One of those commands is the great commandment, to love one another as I have loved you. Turning our focus to the particular visual uh, manifestation of Matthew's Gospels. We can all read it. Do not make the Great Commission your great omission. And I would say that uh, this is one slide that speaks to many mainline churches. It's a sin or a downfall of omission, of leaving something out. Yes, lot is, a lot is included. Fellowship, friendship, dinners, justice campaigns, pastoral care, Sunday school. But the Great Commission of evangelizing in a holistic and invitational way is, no doubt about it, a great omission in many churches and even denominations. A third scripture, Acts chapter 17 and verses 16 to 34. Paul waited for them in Athens, and there his whole soul was revolted at the sight of a city given over to adultery. In the synagogue he debated with the Jews and the God-fearing, and in the marketplace he debated every day with anyone whom he met. Even a few Epicurean and Stoic philosophers argued with him. Some said, what can this parrot mean? And because he was preaching about Jesus and the resurrection, others said, he seems to be a propagandist for some outlandish gods. They got him to accompany them to the Areopagus, where they said to him, Can we know what this new doctrine is that you're teaching? So st Paul stood before the whole council of the Areopagus and made this speech. People of Athens, I have seen for yourself how extremely scrupulous you are in all religious matters. Therefore, as I strolled round looking at your sacred monuments, I noticed among other things an altar inscribed to an unknown God. In fact, the unknown God you revere is the one I proclaim to you. Since God made the world and everything in it, he himself 
is Lord of heaven and earth. And so the warning call through this scripture and this image and Paul speaking in Athens is to not think that people have lost faith. They may not be connected to churches, but like the Athenians, people around and about us, people in our own homes or families or neighborhoods or community, if you just scratch the surface, you're going to find that people have faith. It may be their faith is in an unknown God, unknown to them, or maybe their faith is unknown. But we are made as spiritual beings, and so there is spirituality and faith in every corner and every breath and every child and every person. And that needs to be recognized and acted on by the church. Our next scripture from Genesis chapter 15 and verses 15 to 18. Genesis chapter 15. For your part, your ancestors will join you in peace. You will be buried at a happy old age. In the fourth generation, they will come back here. For until the iniquity of the Amorites have not reached its full extent, when the sun had set and it was dark, there appeared a smoking firepot and flaming torch passing between the pieces. That day, God made a covenant with Abraham in these terms. To your descendants, I give this country, and your descendants will be as many as stars in the sky. And so the image is of that promise given to Abraham of his descendants being as many as the stars in the sky. And here, the thematic emphasis of the church is a call, don't just think of today. Don't just think of our current circumstances, our current attendance, our current financial status, our current place in the way of the world. Remember, remember this covenant promise to Abraham. Remember the pioneers who built Bethesda Church and other churches. Remember family, perhaps family members in the Bethesda Cemetery. Remember times and seasons of comfort and joy and exaltation. Remember in more recent years, Bethesda choosing to become a viable single point of charge. Remember the, uh, the movement of our vision to include our link spaces as part and parcel of who we are as a church. Remember God's promises. Don't just think about the present. And our next scripture comes from Paul's letter to the church at Colossae, chapter 4. Colossians 4 and verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Devote yourselves to prayer. To bathe and to accompany all visions, all projects, all possibilities. Prayer and its place in Bethesda, in our own lives. Prayer not j just as an intercession, not just as supplication, but of thanksgiving, as dwelling in God's presence and seeking his direction through the Spirit for our lives individually and as a church. Prayer. And our next scripture is from 1 Peter, 
chapter 4. And verses 1 to 3. As Christ has undergone bodily sufferings, you too should arm yourselves with the same conviction. Because for the rest of life on earth, that person is ruled not by human passions, but by the will of God. You spent long enough dealing with those passions, but now choose to live as godly people and be sure that you are stewards of the, of the gifts that God has given and each of them to serve others, being faithful stewards of God's grace in its various form. There's that word, stewards. So those who look at hindrances to church growth aren't backwards in saying that the church must be intentional in thinking about its stewardship, its use, its planning of all resources, financial, property, building, each and every man, woman, and child how will we best be stewards of our resources? And our next scripture comes from the book of the Psalms. And it may be very familiar to Bethesda uh, and the Link folks, because it is the Psalm that is the caretaker for uh, the uh, wooded nook. It begins like this. How blessed is anyone who rejects the advice of the wicked and does not take a stand in the path that sinners tread, nor a seat in company with cynics, but his, do, his delight is in the law of the Lord and murmurs his law day and night. Such a one is like a tree planted near stream. It bears its fruit in season. And the shout out, the call out here is to be like this tree in Psalm 1. Psalm 1. To be planted and growing. Again, to say that the Christian life, yes, is worship, yes, is mission, but is also growth, is also ongoing Sunday school for every age. And so, as our anniversary comes up in November, there'll be a return to a Fed Talks, filling out, at least in a small way, this invitation to be like a tree planted. And the focus of it, the focus of that educational time, that Psalm 1 time, will be looking at these various possibilities of hindrances, and positive ways forward as our church. And turning to the last in the collection of scriptures and the last of our collection of images and perspectives for today, Psalm 100. Acclaim Lord, the Lord, all the earth, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before into his presence with thanksgiving and songs of joy. Know that the Lord is God. He has made us. We belong to him, his people, the flock of his sheepfold. Come within his gates, giving thanks to his court, singing praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, is everlasting, his constancy from age to age. And in the manifestation image that we have this morning, for the Lord is God is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. And so the shout out from the gathering of these scriptures and reflections, the call is to not just think about how are we going to survive, or even how will there be a church, a Bethesda, uh, for sage, but multiple generations. How will there be a church of witness and faith 
for generations and generations. Our indigenous sisters and brothers give us a lesson for the learning on this front by saying that in making their plans, they do so for five generations still to come. And so, in Pentecost, in thinking about the church, we are between a rock and a hard place. We are between the rock who is Jesus and who has built his church and that hard place of being the church in 2021. And the challenges to be the church is our vision, evangelism, faith that is all around and about us, God's faithfulness to creating the church as wide and as broad as the stars in the sky, the inclusion of all gifts and the stewardship of them, the call to ongoing growth, and the planning for generations still to come. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, we continue in that spirit and that prayer of thanksgiving. Even in this day, as October carries on and November dwells just around the corner, as the uh, as the COVID-19 carries on and people are vaccinated and we see more possibilities for hope, we still pray for the church to have life and breath. And we offer again this Thanksgiving prayer. God, giver of all good, you continually pour your benefits upon us. Age after age, the living wait upon you and find that your faithfulness has no end that your care is unfailing. We praise you that the mystery of life is a mystery of infinite goodness. We praise you for the order and constancy of nature, for the beauty and bounty of the earth, for day and night, summer and winter, seed time and harvest, for the varied gifts of loveliness which every season brings. We give you thanks for all the comfort and joy of life, for our homes and friends and family and church, community and nation, and for the earth itself, and for the love, sympathy, and goodwill of all people. We would pray that this ongoing season of harvest and of gathering in would see us living in and caring for creation. Lord God, Holy Spirit, may we also be so infused with your spirit that we are amply able to give thanks, take in a harvest of hope, and abundantly share thanks and hope to others. We ask that this be the case for our church, for Palermo United Church, and for all gatherings of your people. And we pray in the name of Jesus, the Lord of life. Amen. And indeed, may we and these gifts that are given show by touch and words that Jesus has come amongst us. Bless the gifts and bless the giver. Amen. Turning to our closing prayer on this day of considering giving life between a rock and a hard place. A new heaven and a new earth. We affirm our belief that the love of God, which is greater than all understanding, has the power to unite us to participate in the creation of a new world. We affirm the hope that turns suffering into a creative process. We affirm the hope that enables us to act. God, we hope. Help us to hope together. 
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the rock of our salvation, whose steady love we can lean in and on, may the grace of that Lord Jesus Christ, who is risen and is with us, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit lead us into encountering hard places of illness or depression or difficulty or discontinuity of the need for greater truth and greater reconciliation. May the Spirit enable us to live in these hard places on the rock who is Christ. And may grace, love, and peace be in you and through you, now and always. Amen. For the Rolling Stones, Between a Rock and a Hard Place song, go to the web link here. Thanks, along for, thanks again for coming along. God bless and keep you. Till we see you next time. Thank you.